So first of all, uh, a very warm welcome to everyone. And so for this webinar, we would like to introduce uh, Rockfall 3, which is a tool for statistical Rockfall analysis in 3D. And this is the latest addition to the Rock Science suite of software. So uh, as a brief introduction, uh, my name is Grace, and I am the product manager for Rockfall 3. And uh, joining me today is Ellen Yip. So Ellen is one of the lead developers for the engine of Rockfall 3, and she will be available in our chat, sec chat section to take uh, questions along with some of our other staff members. So we're both very excited to be here today to show you some of the key features of Rockfall 3 and how they can be uh, applied to Rockfall analyses. So for the first part, uh, we will provide an introduction to uh, Rock Science as a company and then some background theory on uh, Rockfall physics. And then afterwards, a demo will be provided. So uh, during the presentation, please feel free to type any questions uh, you might have in the uh, chat. Uh, we have staff answering these questions in real time. And also for any questions that we don't uh, get to, we will try to address these uh, during the Q&A session at the very end. And uh, please keep in mind that we will be posting uh, this video as well as um, the answers to all questions uh, asked. So without further ado, uh, let me jump into the theory section. Or I should say, let me just uh, begin the introduction to the company and then fo follow by the theory. Hi, Grace, I'm back. Oh, excellent. Uh, would um, you... I can try sharing my screen again. OK, OK, so Ellen made it back, and she would be in a very good position to talk about our company and uh, some of the technical background theory for Rockfall 3. So I'm going to hand over the controls to her. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your patience. Uh, so Rock Science was built upon the need for analysis, design, and visualization tools in the mining and civil engineering industry. Starting in 1987, under the leadership of Dr. John Curran, the Rock Engineering Group at the University of Toronto developed and distributed geomechanics software to fill this need. The first suite of programs was supported in part of, by the Canadian mining industry and the provincial and federal governments. Due to the growing software demand, Rock Science was formed in 1996 as a spin-off company from the University of Toronto to handle the increased distribution around the world. Today, we continue to grow and push the evolution of ideas and technology, but our vision remains the same, to develop geotechnical software tools that help professional engineers in the civil and mining industries to overcome the challenges they face every day. This is the team photo before the pandemic started. Dr. John Curran is the one wearing the purple sweater there. Back then, we had about 50 employees. Now we have about 80 employees. With offices in four continents, led by our head office in Toronto and our global network of rock science representatives, you don't have to go very far to reach us. With an active maintenance plus subscription, you get access to all the latest features, technical support, licensing services, and exclusive discounts. Your Maintenance Plus subscription will ensure that you are always at the forefront of geotechnical innovations while getting the highest value for your investment. These are our offered license types. On top of these, we also offer an academic bundle. The Rock Science Academic Bundle has been created with the needs of educational institutes, professors, and the students in mind. The bundle includes all 18 full version softwares in a single pack, priced at a fraction of the commercial cost. This is the full list of our products. We offer 18 top quality products tailored to meet all your civil, mining, and geotechnical needs. These are the main three categories of our tools. So these are our slope stability programs. Among here, you can see slide two, which has become the industry standard 
you can also see Rockfall 2 and Rockfall 3 here. Rockfall 3 is a 3D statistical analysis program. Due to the high uncertainty and difficulty in obtaining field test data through throwing down hundreds and thousands of rocks, we can get a reasonable distribution of the rocks and locations, bounce heights, energies, and velocities along the rock trajectory. So now on to a quick overview of our key new features. The Terrain Generator app is going to be common among our 3D software, from which you can select the site range from a commercial mapping tool or GPS to get the coordinates. Then a terrain can be generated with the range selected from available satellite image data. With a lot of sites in the US and some parts of Europe, you can get data precision to one meter by one meter grid. We'll show you more details in the later demo. So this is a list of compatible geometry file formats that can be imported into Rockfall 3. It's the same across our 3D software. As you can see, we support common 3D geometry files such as OBJ, STL files, and point clouds dot XYZ files. In Rockfall 3, users can transfer textures from an image file to the surface of the model. For example, you can apply texture from a specified location to the surface of your geometry from a JPEG file. These can be images from drones, airplanes, terrain generator, satellite image, etc. And we map it directly onto the triangulated surface. This helps to identify the key areas on the slope. It can get very difficult to visualize where the highs and lows are in both the 3D and 2D views. That's why we added this new feature, topographic lines. Basically, these are equal elevation lines. You can customize the spacing and the coloring. With topographic lines enabled, you can easily draw in cedars, material regions, and barriers by tracing along these lines. As always, you can animate the paths. This short animation shows our RF2 tutorial one reproduced in Rockfall 3. That's the one on the right. Same as in Rockfall 2, Rockfall 3 engine hosts the same lump mass and rigid body method. We'll discuss more in details in the following theory section. Rockfall trajectories consist of four main parts, projectile, impacts, and sliding and rolling when the rock is on the slope surface. Where projectile and sliding and rolling modes follow the basic physics laws of motion that leaves impacts still an open and ongoing physics research topic. First, we'll be talking about rockfall impact theories. There are several popular impact theories for rockfall problems out there. They can be roughly categorized as rigorous, lump mass, and game engine. Lump mass method follows the method developed by Pfeiffer and Bowen, which was adapted into the famous CRISP, the Colorado Rockfall Simulation Program. Game impact engine is a broad term used to describe the physics simulators developed by major players in the gaming industry. When we did our research, we concluded that these engines focus on fast, real-time, and real-looking results. They mostly follow non-smooth dynamics theories with a wide range of wide margin of errors, particularly in finding the exact point of impact. 100% accuracy is sacrificed for speed. Rigorous impact problems can be separated into two main categories, rigid body impacts and soft body impacts. Rigid body impacts, as the name suggests, assumes the colliding bodies are infinitely rigid. 
but in reality, there are no perfect, infinitely rigid bodies. This theory is very good for simulating billiard balls. However, we know rocks and slopes aren't infinitely rigid. They may break and deform upon impacts. So it's not really a good assumption for rock fall problems. Then why am I still talking about it here, you may ask? Because it's relatively fast and easier to solve. There are other popular soft body impact theories. For example, the discrete element method, it puts in springs at the point of impacts. The spring deformation absorbs some energy from the contact. The shortcomings of this method is the long compute time, the difficulty in calibrating the correct spring stiffness to use, and after all, it doesn't account for breaking and deformation of the impacting bodies. So with all those in mind, what most Rockwell pro software uses these days are the rigid body impact mechanics. With proper dampening me mechanisms put in place, we can obtain reasonable results. At the same time, it is relatively easier to get the coefficients of restitutions in the field when comparing to the soft body impact mechanisms. You have to keep in mind that it is still an ongoing research process to perfect the theories and any possible limitations due to the rigid body assumption. The lump mass method follows the method developed by Pfeiffer and Bowen used in CRISP. This is an excerpt from the paper showing the impact equations with rotations. We're using the same formula for 2D and 3D. The only difference is the addition of the new tangential dimension. The coefficients of restitutions for the lump mass engine are velocity based, meaning the coefficients of restitutions are applied to the incoming velocities directly to get the outgoing velocities. These are the source of dampening in the lump mass theory. So energy we can be sure are conserved. A quick review on the coefficients of restitutions. They range from zero to one. A perfectly elastic material will have a R of one, meaning the object striking the, this material will rebound back with the same speed and same height. And if you leave it alone, it will just keep on bouncing on forever. A perfectly inelastic material will have a R of zero meaning an object striking this material will rebound with zero velocity. It basically goes flat and not bouncing back up. So these equations here, they're the equations if you don't consider rotations. If you have considered rotations checked in the project settings, then the relationship is this here. So equations, 2.5 here, so for the outgoing velocities first. Then you plug it back into equation 2.4 to get the outgoing angular velocity. Even though the rock is modeled as a point, an equivalent radius, assuming it's a sphere, is used to compute the outgoing angular velocities. That's why the rock properties, the input asks for both a density and a mass. The rigid body theories using Rockwell 2 and Rockwell 3 are slightly different. Naturally, there's one extra tangential direction to the impact ge geometry. In 2D, the impact theory is based on the book Impact Mechanics by Dr. Strong. And in 3D, the impact theory is based on non-smooth dynamics developed by Dr. J.J. Mohro, pardon my French. This table summarizes the differences that will be explained in later slides. Per Dr. Strong's impact mechanics, the normal coefficient of restitution is energy-based. There is the incoming energy during the compression phase, then there's the outgoing energy during the restitution phase. Dampening in the tangential direction is from friction and is proportional to the dynamic coefficient of friction. In general, it is mu 
multiplying by the normal impulse applied opposite to the incoming tangential velocity. However, it's been observed that friction alone is not sufficient to provide enough energy loss for a realistic analysis. That's why we need to put in extra dampening effects and the option to apply crisp dampening factor. Essentially, it is the tangential coefficient of restitution after the impact calculation for a more realistic simulation. And because of this, we decided to switch to another theory when we were developing the 3D rigid body impact theories. So our 3D rigid body engine will use non-smooth dynamics for its impact calculations. With non-smooth dynamics, it describes the impact event as non-smooth with discontinuity or sudden jump in the object's motion, hence the name non-smooth dynamics. The coefficients of restitutions for the rigid body engine are velocity-based, same as the lump mass engine. Also that it considers dampening by coefficient of restitutions in the tangential direction. This gives a more consistent and comparable results between our lump mass and rigid body engines. I would like to emphasize that this doesn't mean that Dr. Strong's formulation is not as good. Dr. Strong's book complies with Newton's physics laws of motion and Newton's impact theories. The main shortcoming is with the rigid body assumption when we apply these formulation to rock flow problems. Because we all know that after all, rocks and slopes aren't infinitely rigid. <clears throat> That is why we need more help in slowing the rocks down for a more realistic simulation. And now smooth dynamics allow for the flexibility on dampening in the tangential directions with the tangential coefficient of restitution. Similar to the lump mass method, outgoing contact point velocity is the incoming contact point velocity multiplied by the coefficients of restitution. The difference in lump mass and rigid body is that with shapes, you got the shapes and eccentricity or moment arms when you translate the rock's mo motion from its center of mass to the point of contact. So we first have to translate the rock's center of mass translational and angular velocities to the contact point velocities, translational only. Then we apply the coefficient of restitutions to get the outgoing contact point velocities. Lastly, we translate the contact point velocities back to the center of mass translational and angular velocities. And then we just keep the simulation going on and do the same thing at every impact. The lump mass sliding is identical in 2D and 3D. Right now, our rigid body engine doesn't handle sliding. It is coming in the next release. Pseudo sliding is used in lump mass. That means the velocity is reduced, but angular velocity is unchanged, since it is just a point with no moment arm. So with that, I pass to Grace for the demo. Hi everyone. So I have here with me a model open in Rock Fall 3. So for this demo, I will show you how to quickly uh, put together this model from the very beginning. Uh, but for now, I'm just uh, showing you this finished model um, as a, to give you a quick tour of the UI. Uh, so first, um, where my mouse is on the left view, that, that's basically the top view. And then on the right, uh, you have a perspective view. And by scrolling around this black cube at the top right, you can view the model from various angles. Um, these arrow uh, looking tabs at the top is the workflow bar. So it's meant to help guide you through the model construction. And depending on which tab you're in, you can see that uh, you have 
been granted access to different uh, toolbars corresponding to the stage and model construction. Now, in the visibility panel on the very left, you see a list of entities that are present in the model. And we can uh, use these eye looking icons to hide and uh, unhide objects. So for instance, uh, this purple barrier here, I can click on the eye to hide it and then click it again to bring it back. And when selecting an entity, in the properties panel, uh, you have been granted access to edit uh, its properties and geometries. Uh, so with that, let me show you how to put together this model and by opening a new project. Okay, so whenever starting a new project, uh, please go to the project settings, so analysis menu, then project settings. So here you have the option to either uh, use units in either the metric or imperial systems. And under methods, this is where you choose whether to use the lump mass or rigid body options that uh, Ellen discussed in her presentation. Here in solver options, you see the stopping criteria uh, for the rocks, and you may cho uh, choose on different values if you so decide. Uh, for now, we'll just use the default values in the project settings and let's click OK. All right, so the first step to any rockfall analysis is to generate the geometry. And we have uh, various options to do so. So under the geometry menu, we can go to import export. And then for import geometry is where you can bring in the common 3D ge uh, geometry file types that uh, Ellen has talked about. We also have a terrain generator, and I will come back to this because we'll be using this for the demo. And you can also use our uh, 3D primitive geometry tools to construct a uh, slope from scratch. Or if you are an existing uh, Rockfall 2 user, you can bring in a Rockfall 2 section uh, extruded and, and then use the 3D program uh, to examine the 3D effects. So let's go back to geometry and let's use our uh, terrain generator. So basically in the terrain generator, you, are, you can choose uh, to use any location uh, in the world and bring in the, uh, the slope surface, the elevations, as well as an image of the surface. So let's go to satellite image. And you can zoom in to choose a, book, a location. You can enter a search location, or if you have coordinates uh, from GPS, for example, you can enter that as well. So let's do that. Uh, here I'm bringing in coordinates, let's set it. We are now on the west coast um, of the US. So this is California. And uh, we can center our model by just dragging it. And we can also choose the dimensions. Uh, right now we're in two kilometers by two kilometers. Let's choose a smaller area, let's say half, by half kilometer. Okay, we've centered our model and let's just click OK. So the program will then automatically ask you whether you want to set the imported uh, surface as the slope, meaning that is this entity uh, the slope surface that will be interacting with the box? Uh, usually you want to click yes, but for now I want to click no because uh, whenever you import any geometry file, it's always important to check how many triangles are on this surface and whether you can reduce that number to help uh, expedite any uh, subsequent uh, processes. So let's do that. Let's click on or select the terrain object. And let's go to geometry, surface triangulation tools. 
and simplify triangulation. So you can see that the program has calculated over uh, 33,000 triangles for this surface. But this is actually a very manageable uh, number for calculation. But as an example, we can try to reduce it. So let's use the, an accurate simplification scheme that preserves sharp edges. Um, you can choose predefined values for the number of triangles, but we can also customize that number. Let's say we're using uh, 25,000 in this example. And let's hit preview. We suggest uh, viewing your models to see how the simplification has affected. And let's just accept the geometry using 24999 triangles. Okay. Now, the next step after simplification is to check if there are any defects in your file. So let's select the terrain again, geometry menu, repair geometry. So across uh, all of our software, we have geometry tools that help you repair your mesh or the slope surface in this case. Uh, we want to make sure that our slope surface is watertight and free of holes, for example. And we have the option to repair all the uh, 28 defects identified. Let's do that. Hit repair. And now you see that all the defects have been repaired. We have zero defects. And let's click OK or close. All right, so our slope looks a little bit light at the moment. Let's just adjust the transparency. And now we can clearly see the uh, surface features of our terrain. You can see that Highway 1 is running across this model. And we also have the uh, Pacific Ocean to the left here. OK. so. Um, you can see that this is uh, great for uh, civil applications, but let's say if you are in mining, um, options available to you for bringing the geometry would be to import, uh, let's say, a geometry file for your open pit mine. Um, the option we're using, which is the terrain generator, is really great if you wanted to bring in a natural slope uh, bounding infrastructure, for example. Okay, so we have our slope now. The next step would be to define uh, the materials and the material regions on the slope. So let's go to materials menu and then define materials. By default, there are three materials available. And you can see that for each, uh, the parameters for input are the restitutions in the normal and tangential directions, uh, as well as the friction angle. And for each parameter, you have the option to um, define a statistical distribution, if desired. So let's just uh, use these default values for now, but rename them to a hard material, a soft material. And the soft material definitely should have lower values of uh, restitution compared to the hard material. Uh, lastly, um, let's define water and let's give it a nice blue color. Now for the water, uh, we would like to use restitution values of zero and a friction angle of, let's say, 90 degrees and no distributions. The idea here is that once the rocks impact the water, they would be stopped. And let's click OK. Now, to actually uh, define where these materials go on the slope, we will then go to our visibility panel, then select material regions. Actually, before doing that, 
Um, we should definitely set this geometry as the slope surface. So we're saying that this is the slope that we're going to be using in our calculations. Okay. Now, when you're setting material regions or when you're defining cedars, a really uh, helpful feature is to click lines. Okay. And uh, right now, these lines are quite dense, but we can change the spacing. It's at 20 meters. Let's just change it to a spacing of 100 meters. Now let's go back to our material regions, sign where the different materials go. So let's draw a new region. So you can see in this material properties drop down menu, the hard material comes first. So that means by default, this hard material has already been uh, assigned to the entire slope. So all we have to do would be to assign where the soft material goes and where the water goes. So let's first draw the water. Okay. So we'll just roughly trace along the shoreline. And we can use the contour lines to uh, help us with that. Right click, done. Let's draw a new region for the soft material, let's say, okay. So let's assume that this soft material includes uh, the highway and we'll just follow the contour line for elevation uh, 80. And then right click, done. So you see that the water has been buried, but we can select the region that defines the water and move it up on the list. So now the water uh, over is overlying the soft region. We are now done with defining material regions. So let's exit this mode and go back to our visibility. Okay. So as you can see from our workflow bar, the next step would be to define cedars. Let's go to define cedar properties. Okay. Um, in cedar properties, you would have to specify the number of rocks for the cedar, as well as the initial conditions for the rock in terms of the translational and rotational velocity. And you can see that under the cedar property one is this group one. And groups are essentially defined by the mass and density of the rock. So let's just say for this cedar property, we have a group of rocks with a mass of 1,000 kilograms and 2,700 uh, kilograms per meter cubes for the density. We can now go down to this plus button to either add a new cedar property or a new group. Let's add a new group. So for this new group, let's specify it as small rocks, and we can change the mass to less than 1,000 kilograms, so let's say 200 kilograms. Now for the large and small rocks, we can uh, calculate, let's say, 50 rocks per group. So there will be 50 large rocks and 50 small rocks. And then let's give it some translational velocity of one meters per second. We can define the orientation of the velocity by either vector form or trend and plunge. Let's just use trend and plunge. And let's use a trend of 270 degrees. So this is uh, 270 degrees clockwise from north. And let's just say 
uh, we want to give it a statistical distribution, a normal distribution with a mean of 270 degrees and a standard deviation of 10. And let the relative minimum and maximum values be three times above. And let's say OK. We can also add a new seeder property by clicking on plus, then add new seeder property. Now for this new property, let's use 30 rocks uh, overall, a translational velocity. So these velocities could uh, come from uh, vibrations, uh, earthquakes, etc. And let's give it a trend as well. Let's say 205 for the trend with a normal distribution and a standard deviation of 25 degrees and three times the standard deviation for the relative min and max. And let's say OK. And let's say OK. All right. We can now draw. Uh, the locations of the cedars. So under the cedar menu, you can see that we have the option to add a point cedar, line cedar, or plain cedar. Uh, let's just define a plain cedar first. We're going to use cedar property two, which has uh, 30 rocks overall. We're going to basically select a point on slope. And then let's say the rock is dropping about two meters above the surface we'll pick on the viewpoints. Okay. Let's say uh, this rock is, the cedar is originating from an elevation of 180. Let's say, okay. Uh, next, we can define a line cedar. We can do that through this cedar menu here by adding a line cedar, or we can use our geometry tools, such as defining a polyline, sorry, drawing a polyline and then converting that to a line cedar. So let's do that. Let's go to geometry and then draw a polyline. Now we can trace along an elevation of 120. to get our polyline, right click, done. We'll select the polyline, go to Cedars menu, and then add line cedar from pole. So this will help uh, imprint your polyline onto the slope into a line cedar. So for this line cedar, we'll use cedar property one, which has 50 large rocks and 50 small rocks. We will also say it drops from a height above the surface of say, two meters and let's say, okay. Okay, and the polyline has been converted to a line cedar. So the next step in the workflow is to define barriers, but let's just compute our results first and we can come back to the barrier design as a last step. So to compute, let's click this compute button here. Okay, so you can see that was fairly quick. We had uh, a total of 130 rocks. Now to visualize results, go to results. Okay, let me just turn or apply the material region view for easier viewing to see how the rocks are interacting with our terrain. So what you're seeing here um, are the rock path and the contours are showing the translational velocity. So we have paths in the legend to the right. And then you can, the calculated quantity right now is translational velocity, but you can also check, uh, check the kinetic energies, bounce heights, uh, run out distance, etc. 
So now you can see that there is actually a spread in the rockfall path originating from the point seeder. And that's because we did, a, we did specify a normal distribution in the trend as the starting velocity for the seed. Now, we can also view how the rocks are interacting with the surface, such as where they're impacting the slope or where the rock falls are ending. So let's select surface. And then we're now viewing a histogram of the endpoints. Let me just turn off the rock paths. We can change the resolution a larger number or it becomes a finer resolution. So these histograms are uh, useful in deciding where you can place your infrastructure, where, where not to place the infrastructure. And also these uh, heat maps, when used in conjunction with our statistical tools, uh, you can use these for back analysis. So let's turn off the heat maps for now and let's go back to the rock path. So a cool feature in this program is that you can view the animation of all the rock falls. So let's go to animate rocks. And let's just view all the rock falls at the same time. So I'm going to uncheck animate one at a time and then hit play. So you can see that some of the rocks uh, stopped early higher up on the slope, while others are rolling down the slope and landing near or on the highway. Let's close this. And we also allow you to view the information for each rock path. So we go to rock path information. So here for each um, rock fall, you can view the stopping reason, maximum kinetic energy, velocity, et cetera. And then by selecting the rock fall, you can also see the path details. And by path details, I mean the positions and velocities with time. And this data can be uh, exported to Excel or further processing if needed. Let's just close this. Uh, in this uh, information, area, you can sort the rock falls. So for instance, if I click on maximum kinetic energy, now it's sorted from minimum energy to max. I click it, I click the header again. Okay, now it's sorted from the maximum energy to the minimum. We also have filters available. So on the left here, we can edit our filters. So let's say we would only like to view information about rocks from the point seeder, and let's just view all of it. Now you can see the views have been updated. And then we can go back to our path information and say, okay, well, we have been, these have already been sorted by maximum kinetic energy. Let's select this path and view which one it is. So we select it and then highlight selected points and the view has been updated to show you the path that has a maximum kinetic energy. And you can do this for runout distance, velocity, et cetera. Okay, so now let's go back and put in some barriers. Let's go to barriers. Define barrier properties. And we have two ways of doing this. Uh, first is for a custom model type, um, the capacity can be either infinite or a custom value can be entered for the capacity. 
way is to use our predefined uh, barrier manufacturers library. So let's open that. So we are providing uh, barrier information from five different manufacturers. The models are uh, available to scroll through on the left. And the information on the right here includes the uh, barrier heights, the capacities, elongation. And for some of these uh, models, you can choose to use capacity values from either the MEL or SEL test types. And at the very bottom here, we provide a uh, link to the uh, original specification sheet. So let's just uh, use a barrier. Let's choose this one and let's just call this barrier property one. Okay. Now we add barriers much like um, how we add line seeders. We are using barrier property one. We do need to define a height. So let's just use, uh, let's say three meters. And then we can add these points on the viewport. So we know that the rock falls from this line seeder are coming down on the slope. So we can install these barriers uh, at the contour line that's 80 meters in elevation. Right click, done. We can add multiple barriers. So let's do that to stop the rocks from the point seeker. We're using the same barrier property. Let's also change the height to three meters and add points on viewport. Right click, done, and okay. Now we can quickly recompute to get the results. Okay, so now you see that from the rock falls from both seeders have been uh, stopped by the barrier. We can graph barrier data as well. So under interpret menu, let's graph barrier data. So for barrier one, which is under the line seeder, let's take a look at the uh, translational kinetic energy. Let's plot it in a histogram. Okay. So you can see that the capacity of that barrier was at 500 and all the translational kinetic energy energies were uh, less than that value. So that's why the rock falls were stopped by the barrier. Um, the last feature I would like to show is our section exporter to Rockfall 2. So Rockfall 3 can be a very useful tool to investigate uh, 3D effects and the critical slope sections. And once you have identified where the critical slope section might be, you can then export that section into Rockfall 2, which is 2D, so you can throw many, many rocks on the slope uh, for very fast computation. So let's go back to geometry. And then under geometry menu, let's do a rockfall to section creator. And we can create a section. We just move this uh, cursor here. We can rotate to get our section. And let's export section data to Rockfall 2. We'll export the barriers and the line seeders. Okay. Okay, so this is the section that's been exported to Rockfall 2. So this is Rockfall 2 you're seeing now. And um, all the materials have been exported. We have the water, soft material, and the hard material. This crosshair 
is the line seeder that was in 3D, but in 2D now it's just a point seeder. And this uh, purple line here is the barrier. So with that, um, that wraps up the demo. And now we have a few minutes to answer any questions. Let me just look through the list of questions asked and see which ones have not been answered. OK. Oh, so one of the questions asked was, how often does rock science update the satellite photos? Uh, the answer to that is we don't update the uh, satellite images ourselves. We actually use a third party software called uh, Mapbox. Uh, are there any plans to add attenuators to barrier calculations? Uh, currently, attenuators are not included, but this has come up frequently. And I do believe that there is some research going on in the industry to how to uh, properly model attenu attenuators uh, such as drapes. Uh, train mode is available for America and Canada. But so the terrain generator is available uh, for around the world. Uh, but keep in mind that the resolution does depend on um, regions. So for some regions, we have more satellite data than others. And those with greater, with more satellite data, you're just going to have higher resolution. What is the source of the elevation data and what is the surface resolution? Okay, so we just answered that question. The, it's from a third party uh, technology and the surface resolution depends on where you are in the world and the amount of data available. Can you create your own rock shapes for the model? Uh, so currently, if you some rigid body mode, uh, you should be able to, but right now uh, in this version one of Rockfall 3, we only have spheres. So stay tuned for different rock shapes because they are in the works. Uh, any PDH certificates? Uh, I'm not sure about this one, but we can look into this and uh, get back to you when we send out all the answers. Have you carried out any field trials to validate the results of the program? So if you look into our documentation, we have compared to analytical solutions as well as validated our 3D results with the 2D uh, results. Uh, we encourage you to check the uh, validation examples we do have online. Is it possible to use the surface with geo-reference image, for example, ECW uh, TIF? Uh, this one we will have to get back to you right now. I'm not exactly sure. Is there any plan to validate dash calibrate models with real field databases, such as from Doppler radars, locating, tracking, alerting rock balls in real time? which could be the useful input uh, values and parameters. Uh, so a lot of our users actually calibrate um, our, their, their own models, and you really should do this for your own site. And as for tracking and alerting rock falls in real time, uh, we are thinking about potentially comparing our models with some uh, real-time data, so stay tuned for that. Uh, I can't disclose too much of it at the moment. Uh, which could be the useful input values parameters? Absolutely. If you calibrate your model to the field, these would be the best parameters uh, for your site. But keep in mind that we also have um, available in our materials library. So let me go to materials, define materials. Um, if you're not sure which materials which material properties to use. We saw that going to our materials library and looking at uh, provided reference values as a guide. So these are all the questions. Um, so we are running out of time. Uh, we will be posting this video as well as the answers to all the questions uh, very soon. So thank you everyone. Uh, for taking the time to attend this webinar. Um, we do appreciate your questions. And definitely, if you have any feedback, 
for us or if, if there are any suggestions, uh, please let me know. We always we are always interested in knowing what our customers value and how we can make the software is better for them. Uh, please feel free to reach out at any time. And also, uh, as we prepare for future webinars, uh, we will also like to hear from you if there are specific topics of interest. Okay, everyone, thank you so much. We hope you enjoy this webinar, and we hope to see you in a future one. Take care. Bye-bye.